Hello and welcome to lecture 10 of semantics. So, so far in the in the course, we started with the small L1 language and we progressively added features to it, like variable bindings and functions, like sums, like products, like references. And now we have a programming language, which is a, you know, a small, if real programming language, like it's a a genuine subset of standard ML, and it contains actually most of the important features of, S of ML, except for generics or polymorphism. And so if we uh, take a moment to look at the history of programming languages and, and, the, and the, the application of logic to them, you know, you can, we can see that we've actually come pretty far. So, uh, so, you know, the the origins of formal logic and formalizing languages at all dates back to the 1880s when Frege um, came up with the first formalization of logic that included a, a satisfactory account of variables and variable binding, and in and the um, understanding of variable binding that you've learned in this class is actually due to his work, um, and then it took about 50 years of work after that before logicians invented the lambda calculus which again is the core of what we've uh, what we've been looking at in this course and their their motivation was actually a little bit surprising so once frege formalized logic the i it became very natural to ask what exactly are we doing when we write mathematical proofs like when you do a, do a proof there's some arguments there's some computations and what do we mean but when we say something like the result follows from computation and like what is a procedure to solve a problem and these these are these are questions that came into reach uh, into the reach of mathematics once you had a formal account of what mathematics itself actually was and uh, that was the motivation for things like the lambda calculus and it actually came as a bit of a surprise when it turned out that these uh, calculi which had been developed in the foundations of mathematics could be used more or less as is as programming languages so the the very first programming languages were uh, were literally assemblers so that you wouldn't have to remember the binary mnemonics and it was only a little bit later that uh, the idea of algebraic programming languages were invented with things like uh, Fortran and Lisp and Lisp itself ended up being a transcription of the of the lambda calculus onto 1950s era computers and everyone was uh, surprised when it worked as well as it did and then Throughout the throughout the nineteen sixties, um, the relationship between formal logic and uh, and programming language semantics was, you know, first articulated and then uh, and then worked out, um, like both here at Cambridge and at other places by people like Christopher Strachey and Dana Scott, and. They, uh, a series of languages, very influential languages like Algol were invented, the Curry-Howard correspondence was discovered, and the entire idea of an abstract machine was invented in the 1960s. So many of the things that, you, that we take for granted today were hard-won inventions by the 60s. And it was only by the 70s that uh, um, ideas like polymorphism and some types and things like this first began to be under, understood. And so you can sort of see the uh, this this course of semantics as uh, as covering sort of the first hundred years of uh, of semantics. And you know the original models of programming languages were actually denotational models, like we talked about in the first lecture. And it was only in the early eighties that uh, the operational semantics of the form that we've been studying in this course actually were uh, were properly articulated. But, you know, language design did not stand still. People invented things like uh, object-oriented programming and uh, formal calculi for them, like object calculi. Um, languages like ML and Haskell were defined and formalized, and um, ideas like subtyping were articulated, and then their theory was worked out in the 80s and the 90s. And, you know, nowadays, uh, nowadays, like... Uh, you know things have uh, things have advanced quite a bit. We have 
typed assembly, language, compile time checking of memory management, and uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of security properties are enforced at compile time by uh, by type by type checking. So, for instance, the WebAssembly uh, uh, mechanism in your browser, which lets you run low-level code in your browser, that relies on type safety to prevent. Uh, Random hackers on the internet from sending you scripts that will corrupt your uh, that will corrupt your heap and uh, exfiltrate all your secure data. So there's it's been a long it's been a long time and the stuff you've learned in this course basically puts you in a position to be able to read read papers in programming languages theory like it doesn't bring you right up to the state of the art but it brings you to the point where with a bit of work you'll be able to read papers that are at the state of the art. Um, and so this uh, this kind of first uh, semantics, the first hundred years, has taken up the first uh, the first uh, three quarters of the course. And so in the remaining quarter of the course, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three features that uh, that actually used the stuff we've learned at the beginning of the course. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about subtyping and objects and how they can be encoded and modeled. Um, in the in the uh, next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the semantic equivalence of programs, and in the uh, which is which is what justifies things like compilers optimizing uh, optimizing uh, um, code. So you need to know that the optimizations that a compiler performs don't actually change the meaning of a program. And then finally, we'll wrap up with an introduction to how you can use semantics to study concurrency. Like, how do you specify what it means for a program to be, uh, to be concurrent? How do we talk about the atomicity or not of different actions? How do we model locking and use the semantics to actually prove things? And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move right on to subtyping and object-oriented programming. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a step back and think about the word polymorphism. And so what this means intuitively is that polymorphism is just the ability to use a, a program expression at many different types. And the, uh, the, the, uh, there are two main kinds of polymorphism that you see in programming language. So the first kind of polymorphism, and actually the first kind that was invented, is what is called ad hoc polymorphism. And so this is, this is what happens when you have a symbol like the plus sign, and you can use it at multiple different types. So for instance, we, could, we might want to use the plus symbol to represent addition, but in a programming language, there will be many different numeric types, maybe integers and floating point numbers and big integers and so on. And we'd, we'd ideally like to be able to use the same plus to uh, add any, any, two, any two numeric types. Um, and uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, way that you, the way that you implement this is different for every single every, every single type like you use a different machine instruction to add two integers as opposed to add two floating points and if you want to add uh, two large integers so two big integers you're actually going to have to make two function calls and like run some uh, algorithm like uh, like that runs in an actual loop to do the addition and uh, now what hap now what will happen is that that's not the only kind of polymorphism that you can have. So the other kind of polymorphism that you can have is what's called parametric polymorphism. And so in parametric polymorphism, it's going to be like you have in OCaml, where you can write one definition which works at many different types. And uh, you saw in Foundations of CS how you could write things like a map function, which would work on lists of any type, or uh, or something like a length function on a list, which would add up uh, uh, the elements of lists of any type. But the but the the key part about parametric polymorphism is that uh, um, the definition is uniform in 
the actual concrete type. Like you run the same code no matter what the actual type, at runtime type of a type variable is. And finally, there is something that's a sort of in between ad hoc and poly parametric polymorphism, which is subtype polymorphism. And so this is this is seen in uh, many OO languages, and uh, there is. The reason I say it's sort of in between ad hoc and parametric polymorphism is that uh, that's how inheritance works. So if you inherit from a class, the inherited code runs just the same, but at the same time you have the ability with inheritance to override methods and uh, do some ad hoc overloading when, in your inherited class. And so subtyping, subtype polymorphism of the O style is sort of in between ad hoc and parametric polymorphism. So there, there is a relationship, but you don't necessarily run the same code every single time. Okay. So th you might ask, okay, well, lots of languages have subtyping, but why do they have it at all? And so to understand this, it's worth looking at the um, function application rule. And so the application rule said, okay, if you have a function argument E1 of type T to T prime and an argument T, which matches that, that uh, argument type of the function, then the result will be the type T prime. And so that's fine, but if you think back to the records that we saw in the last lecture, oh, where are records? So with record types, a record type is a list of labels and types. And what this means is that our, sub, our typing rule for applications means that uh, if you have a function and what it needs is a record with a single field, so here we take a, uh, a record that has a single field p of type integer and then we project out the p component from the integer. So this will be so a function which takes a record and returns an integer. And if we pass it an argument which doesn't just have a p but it also has a q, then we'll fail type checking. And so this is quite frustrating because the argument to this function actually does have a p field. And so if you tried to project out a p component, it should succeed. So in some sense, we're giving this, uh, we're giving this function a better argument than the, with more stuff in it than it actually needs. And the function is saying, no, I don't want that. This is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is against my religion. This is unacceptable to me. Okay. So the idea with subtyping is to say, well, this record type is a better type, PQ is a better type than the type PINT, because any time we want a record with PINT in it, it's always safe to give it a record PINT QINT, because you can always ignore the Q field. And so this idea of of betterness induces a relation between types, which we call the subtyping relation. And we write T is a subtype of T prime. And the idea is that T can be used anywhere T prime can be. So PQ can be used anywhere P, P is expected because PQ has more information inside of it. And so we'll include PQ is a subtype of PINT, and PINT is a subtype of the empty record. And so then, once we've introduced the subtype relation, which is the better than relation of typing, what we'll do to the system, our typing system is we'll include what's called a subsumption rule. And this says, if E has a type T, and T is a subtype of T prime, then E also has the type T prime. So we're saying, well, whenever we have an expression with a type, we're allowed to forget some of the information in T to get like sort of the, the less general type T prime or the less, useful, the, the less useful type T prime. And so if we have an E of type T and we're allowed to forget some of the information in T to get to a T prime, then E also has the t uh, type T prime. And what this will let us do is it will let us deduce that a record p is equal to 3, q is equal to 4, has the type p colon int. And so what, well, what's going on here is p 
equals 3, Q equals 4, we'll have the type P int Q int, and P int Q int is subsu uh, is uh, is a uh, has more information in it than p int does. So uh, so p q is subsumed by p. And so if you look at this typing derivation, you can see what happens here. So here we have our our example which didn't type check before, and now what we're doing is we're going to say all right, well p int projects p from the record x, and if you look at the typing uh, typing for this function, it's pretty much what you expect. So this variable x of type p int goes into the context, and then we type check the pro pro projection, and the projection says, well, x has to have the type p int, which indeed it does. And so this whole function will have the type record p int to the type int. And now what about our argument? p is equal to 3, q is equal to 4. Well, we want it to have the type p int because that's what the function expects. And in order to make that happen, we're going to have to use our subsumption relation. We're going to have to say, well, it's okay to infer the type p int q int for this record with two fields, but then you have to use this subsumption to forget this q and get to the p colon int. So now we have a value that has a bit of extra information in it at runtime, but the type doesn't let us see it anymore. It's just, uh, it's just hidden. Okay, so now this program will work because we can pass a record with extra fields to a function that only wants some of them. And now let's see how we can actually formalize the subtype relation. So when we say when we say that the subtype relation is uh, is kind of a relation of forgetting, where you say the relation the type t has more information or at least as much information as t prime does, then it's obvious that the relation has to be reflexive and it has to be transitive. So t should always be a subtype of itself. So you can go from t to a t by forgetting nothing. And the subtype relation should also be transitive. So if t is a subtype of t prime and t prime is a subtype of t double prime, then we should expect t to be a subtype of t double prime. Because intuitively, to get from t to t prime, we forget a bit of info. And to get from t prime to t double prime, we forget a bit more info. And so we should be able to forget a lot of information to go from t to t double prime. So we forget things here and we forget things here. And so we should be able to go from t to t double prime. Okay, so one thing to uh, one thing to notice here is that the subtype relation is not actually symmetric because the relation says I have more information here and less information over here. It's not the case that if t t is a subtype of t prime that the converse t prime is a subtype of t holds. So that is absolutely not the case, and in fact I'll repeat it again later. Okay, but now that we have like sort of the the basic properties formalized as rules, how can we actually talk about subtyping for records? And there are actually several ways of doing this. And so what, the first form of subtyping you might think of is what's called width subtyping. So what it says is that going from one type to another, we should be able to forget some of the records. So if we have records t1 to tk and tk uh, label k plus 1 to label k plus k prime, what we should be allowed to do is we should be allowed to drop some of these labels so that we only keep the first k labels. And this subtyping rule is called the width subtyping rule. So what it lets you do is it lets you drop some of the uh, fields from a record type. The other thing you, you can allow is you can also allow subtyping within fields. And so this is called rec depth subtyping. And it says that if you have two records with the same set of labels, then the first is a subtype of the second if it is component-wise a subtype. So if you have uh, t1 is a subtype of t1 prime all the way to tk is a, subtype, is a subtype of tk prime, then 
the record label 1 T1 to label K TK is going to be a subtype of label 1 T, T1 prime to label K TK prime. And so the reason you might want depth subtyping is that if you have width subtyping, then what you're going to get is that something like, uh, let's say, p int q int is a subtype of p int. And this uses uh, width subtyping. OK, that's fine. But we will not be able to show that, a, that uh, if we have a nested record, that the subtyping holds with just with subtyping. And so this, uh, this requires depth subtyping. So here, uh, this, this will not work. So uh, so we are, not, we are not able to do a subtyping relation here, even though all we've done is we've taken this valid subtyping, PQ is a subtype of P, and wrapped it in a record label. So we're saying, OK, if you have a record type where you have a record uh, whose field R is another record, we're not able to forget the second field of that record. Of that record. And so that's why we need to add rec depth subtyping. And so now if you have both width and depth subtyping, then subtyping for records will sort of work the way you intuitively expect it to. So here what we've got is a, uh, a record which says, OK, I want to check if x colon p int q int and y r int is a subtype of x with p int and y with the empty label. And to do to check that, what we've got to do is we've got to check the subtyping field by field. And so first, we have to check that p q p int q int is a subtype of p int, and that follows by our record subtyping. So this uh, this thing has more fields than that one. And similarly, uh, for the other for the other field y, we have to check that r int is a subtype of the empty record. And so what you're going to see here is, again, you can get this with width subtyping. So uh, our int is a longer record than just the empty record, so it's naturally a subtype. OK. And so now one additional thing you might consider is allowing reordering of fields. So if we have label 1 uh, t1 to label k tk, we might want to allow a uh, additional uh, subtyping rule that says that for any permutation of these k labels, label permute 1 uh, t pi 1 to label pi k tk, uh, t of pi k gets permuted. And so this is a little bit abstract, but what this means is that, uh, let me let me write not subtype, uh, yeah, so, the, so right now what we've got is we do not have we do not have the subtyping relation that if you have a record p int q int then that's a subtype of q int p int so this requires the permutation rule and so how does that permutation rule work in this case and so in order to get that what we have to do is we have to say all right if you have p int q int, then what I want is I want some permutation on the labels. And so you, we can define a function pi of p is equal to q and pi of q is equal to p. And now with this permutation, when we do uh, pi of uh, p colon int, and pi of uh, uh, q colon int, this thing is going to sort itself out and become q int p int. So all we're doing is we're saying this permutation says swap p and q. So wherever a p int occurs, put it to a q int, and wherever q int occurs, put it to p int. And in fact, we can even put in the type annotations as well.
And the thing that makes this correct, or at least plausible, is that this permutation is actually a permutation. It's just reordering the labels. It's not actually, uh, it's not actually introducing any new types. And so now, now that we have these three notions of, of subtyping for records, if we throw all of them in, along with the reflexivity and transitivity rules, we have a credible subtype relation. And the thing I want to reiterate is that the subtype order is not anti-symmetric. So if A is a subtype of B, it's absolutely not the case that B is a subtype of A. So subtyping is a pre-order, it is not a... Uh, a partial order. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is one more one more fact about this. So subtyping is not anti-symmetric. So it's a pre-order. So if A is a subtype of B and B is a subtype of A, then that doesn't mean that A and B are actually equal. And you can see this with the uh, with the permutations here. So if we had three labels P, Q, and R, we can we can have uh, we can have three different permutations. And they won't necessarily be uh, they won't necessarily be equal. So we're allowed to, we're allowed to rename things, and then this gives us an equivalence class of types, the sub mutual subtyping. Okay, so now we come to one of the things that stymied people for a long time, which is how to do subtyping for functions, and the. The thing that is somewhat confusing about subtyping for functions is that it's what's called contravariant. So if you want to say that t1 to t2 is a subtype of t1 prime to t2 prime, well, you want the results to be subtype uh, sub, to have the subtype relation you expect. So uh, t2 should be a subtype of t2 prime, but for the arguments, things get reversed. So we want the t1 prime to be a subtype of t1. And so you can ask, what is going on here? Why did, why are, why is the argument to a function contravariant? And there are, uh, there are a lot of ways of thinking about this. And one way of thinking about it is that if you have a function f which takes t1 to t2, then we can safely give f any argument which is a subtype of t1. So if our function f is this record projecting projecting thing, which takes a uh, which takes a record with uh, a field p colon int and then produces some new record p to q, then what we want is we want subtyping to be able to say well, and when you pass x an argument that uh, has more fields in it, that's okay, and something with more arguments is a subtype. And so that's why you have to flip it around. Um, so now here is uh, here is another here's another example of how this works. So what we so if we have this function f x p colon n to two, it builds a record with uh, using the first element of that p. Then there's some many valid types we could give it. We could say well it's a function which takes a p int and gives you a p int to a q int. Or we can say, well, as soon as we see this, we can apply subsumption and forget that this Q field even existed, and now we get P int to P int. Or we can say, well, what if we gave X, this function F, extra argument, uh, extra re uh, record with extra fields in it, like say a Q. Then it would be P int Q int to P int Q int. And all of this arises from the fact that P int Q int is a subtype of P int. And so here, what we've got is uh, um, that we have a function which takes a record with two arguments, with two fields, P and Q, and it uses them both in the result. And so what we can do is we can say that F is a function which takes a record with a p int and a q int field and returns a record with just a p field. That's the easy type to read, but subsumption also gives us um, other types and other types we don't have. So remember that uh, subtyping is contravariant. So even though p int q int is a subtype of p int, that won't work as a type for this function because we actually have to have the q argument because we're going to use it. And similarly, we're only building a result 
that has a P field in it. So we can't use uh, uh, covariance sub. We can't we can't add anything in the input. So we can't take anything away from the input, and we can't uh, we can't add anything to the output. So one other thing that I find helpful for thinking about function subtypes is set inclusion. So if you have a uh, uh, if you have a uh, a function f which goes from the set x to the set y and you have a function g which goes from the set a to the set b then if uh, a is a subset is a subset of b uh, and uh, oh sorry a is a subset of x and y is a subset uh, of b, then any f in uh, uh, x to y gives us a function a to b. And so the reason this works is that you know you can think of f as taking every element of x to a y and so if you have an a then a is going to be some a subset of x so every element of a is also an element of x and every element of y is a subset of b so f is also a function that goes from a to b and so if you think about how functions, codomains, and codomains work, that, and you think about subtyping as subsets, then the uh, subtype relation becomes a lot more intuitive. Um, but I want to emphasize that that actually is just intuition, because um, this, uh, this label permutation thing doesn't, doesn't quite work if you think about it as, a, as just inclusion because the value L1, V1, L2, V2 is just, just different than uh, L2, V2, comma, L1, V1. Okay, so now, how does subtyping work for other type constructors? And so, what would, the, way we can, uh, the way we can look at this is uh, we can say, well, for pairs, the way that pairs work is when you have a pair, you have access to both of the components. And so that means that if you want to use a T1 times T2, wherever, as a subtype of T1 prime times T2 prime, well, T1 needs to be a subtype of T1 prime, and T2 needs to be a subtype of T2 prime. And why? Because if you get something of type T1, you can get out a T1 and a T2 from it. So you have to be able to uh, you have to be able to turn either uh, either component in, as a subtype, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave some types as an exercise for you. Um, so we, when uh, we are, we're used to thinking about the relationship between sums and products as being a sort of duality relationship, but when you try it out for uh, for sums, if you think about it in terms of subsets, you'll find out that it comes out in an interesting way. But now we come to references. And so the question with references is um, references, uh, reference type T ref, when should it be a subtype of T prime ref? And there are two obvious answers. And the two obvious answers are that this subtyping between references should hold if T is a subtype of T prime. Um, because after all, if you have a reference, you can get out a T and you need to be able to use it as a T prime. Or you can say, well, maybe I want it the other way around. So maybe T ref is a subset of T prime ref, where if T prime is a subset is a subtype of T. And the justification for this thing might be, well, if I have a T ref and I use it as a T prime ref, and someone stores a T prime into this reference, well, then T prime had better be a subtype of T. And it turns out that neither one of these is good because both of the arguments that I gave to you are correct. If you have a T, T ref, you can get a T out of it. 
So this, this, uh, this condition up here is absolutely essential. But on the other hand, you can put things into a reference as well. And so the contravariant argument also makes sense. And so the only typing rule that makes sense for reference subtyping is t ref is a subtype of t prime if t is a subtype of t prime and t prime is a subtype of t. So they're only, uh, they're only subtypes when they're equivalent types. So, so now uh, we can say, okay, well, what should happen with, uh, with the semantics? And it turns out that for the operational semantics of the language, we don't need to change anything at all because um, the expression grammar didn't change. And the only thing we changed was in the type, type, uh, typing rules. And so now we can go ahead and prove proper uh, type preservation and progress again. And something that you that you may have noticed when doing these progress and preservation proofs for L1 through L3 is that I told you to do it by uh, by rule induction, but structural induction on a term seemed to work just as well. And that's something that only works when uh, languages are, have a syntax directed. Uh, have a syntax directed typing. And now that we've added this rule right here, this subsumption rule, the rules, the typing rules are no longer uh, syntax directed. So we have E in the conclusion and we have exactly the same E in the premise. And as a result, you can't prove things about systems with subtyping by a straightforward structural induction on the syntax. You have to, you have to look at the typing derivations. And so that, that um, sort of restricts how you can prove things, but type preservation and progress will still go through. Like you'll need, to, you'll need to tweak preservation slightly to say that when you take a step, you may get a new type, which is a subtype of the old type. Um, and the thing that you'll find though is that adding subtyping doesn't complicate the theory or the semantics of the language a lot, very much, but it does complicate the implementation quite a lot. And the reason is that the rules are not syntax directed. Um, so you don't know a priori when you should when you should turn to subsumption. And so designing an implementable type system with subtyping in it is a little more complicated than you might first expect. And the other thing you'll know, you'll you'll, uh, you'll discover when you're implementing languages with subtyping is that getting good runtime implementations of things like record subtyping can be surprisingly tricky, um, especially when your subtyping relation allows things like field reorderings. And the reason for this is that when you have a record, what you want to do is you want to compile it as a, basically an array offset. So in a language like Java, if you have a, a point class, what you, the runtime representation of this thing is going to be is you're going to have a pointer to the V table and a tag saying what the class is, and then two fields, one for uh, one, two, Two, two more uh, blocks of memory, one after the other, one for the first field and one for the second field. And so that means that when you do a field, object, uh, field access, so if you have in, a, in your Java code um, something like, uh, you know, uh, point P is equal to something, and then you you try to do something like uh, uh, p dot x times p dot x. So return p dot x. So in this expression, the compilation of p dot x, you expect it to turn into like a very efficient operation. You expect to say, well, the compiler knows how the point class is laid out in memory. So when you get this point, you should be able to take the point pointer, add a constant after set to it, and then do a dereference. So it's like very, it's a, uh, a very cheap machine uh, set of machine instructions. But if you allowed record subtyping, 
uh, sorry, permutation subtyping, then things get much more complicated because when you want to project x from a point p, you don't know if uh, what offset the uh, the field is. And in the worst case, you'll have to store the field names and then do a linear scan. And that's like very unsatisfying from a compiler implementer point of view. And so languages like Java are actually quite cleverly structured to prevent you from ever even thinking the thought of record permutation subtyping. So when you define a class, what you're basically doing is you're defining a record and you're saying that the fields of this record are X and Y. And then when you inherit from the, uh, from the point class, what you're doing is you're keeping the original records and importantly, they're in the original order And then you just add to the end a an additional group of uh, an additional group of fields, and so what this means is that no matter what subclass of point you've got, the first two fields are always going to be the x field and the y field, and so you're able to uh, compile these. Uh, um, field accesses with addition and a jump, just as you could without inheritance. And so uh, that's why Java actually only supports single inheritance. It's in order to make uh, field access fast. Okay, so the subsumption, but speaking of Java, the subsumption rule that we had um, lets you do upcasting. You can go from a type to its super type whenever you like. And you can say, well, if I've got a subtype relation, maybe I don't always want to go to from a more specific to a less, uh, less specific type. Maybe I want to go in the other direction. And so Java style, we could add a cast to our grammar and say, well, what I want is uh, I, I have an expression E and I want to cast it to the type T. And so the typing rule will just say, okay, if E has the type T prime, uh, well, if you see a cast, just assert that it has the type T anyway. And this, in order to implement this safely, you need a dynamic type check. So when you do a cast, casts have to be able to fail at runtime. And so in Java, if you do a down cast and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not true, then you get an exception at runtime. And so what this does is it gives you a lot of flexibility, but at the price of many potential runtime errors. And so one thing, one thing that you'll experience programming with, in languages with generics like uh, ML or even Java these days is that many uses of downcasting can just be better handled better by using parametric polymorphism or generics. And so once you have a language with generics, you'll find yourself turning to downcasts much less frequently. Okay, so I talked a little bit about why the reference, uh, uh, why the reference uh, type couldn't have either of the two subtyping rules that I talked about earlier. And here, what we can do is we can see, we can think about references as an object encoding and we'll see how the, uh, how the uh, invariance for references arises. So what we're going to do is we're going to generalize from references and go think about objects. And so what is an object? Well, an object is a thing that you can invoke methods on. And so what is a method? Well, it's a function you could call. And so what we're going to do is we're going to inv uh, invent some counter objects. And so this counter object C is going to have two methods, get and increment. And when I say methods, all I really mean is it's going to be a record with two functions in it. And the first function is going to have the type unit arrow int, and it's going to yield an integer when it's invoked. And that what the increment method does is it's going to increment the uh, the count the the counter that this counter object is using. So the idea is that if you create a new counter and you call increment on it, then what will happen is that the hidden state of this counter will go from zero to one, so that when you call uh, get on it, you get out a uh, you get out the value one. And so the way that we implement this is by saying, okay, well, I'm going to allocate 
some private state. You can think of this as private fields of an object. And then I'm going to return a record of functions which access this private state. So the get function is just going to dereference this hidden pointer. And the increment function is just going to increment this pointer x. And then what we return from this scope is just this pair of functions. We don't directly return this hidden reference. So let's let's actually implement this in uh, in in OCaml, and so what we can do is let's have our type counter, and we'll say it has a get field, which is unit to int. Let me put in a parentheses just in case, and it has increment, which says okay, it takes a unit and gives you a unit. And so now what we can do is we, let's uh, let's have a, a reference C and we're going to create some private state for it, a reference zero. And then we're going to return two functions, get, which says function unit goes to the contents of R. And we'll say what increment does is it's going to say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set R to the contents of R plus one. And so now we have this counter C. And so if we call C.get, we get the function. And if we call it, we get the number zero. And if we call increment on it, well, we don't see anything yet. Maybe we'll call increment two more times. So we've called it three times in total. And now when we call get, we're going to get the number three. And so we have sort of the essence of object orientation here, where we have some private hidden state, which we can only access by means of the methods of the object. OK, so now you can say, well, how does subtype, how can we, how can we use, uh, how can we model inheritance? And one simple way of modeling the subtyping, subsumption in uh, OO languages is to use record subtyping. So if we have a counter object with three fields with get, increment, and reset, which resets the counter back to zero, then our resettable counter with its three fields, uh, get unit to int, increment unit to int, and reset unit to unit, that's going to be a sub, uh, subtype of the original counter type, get unit to int, inc unit to unit. Um, and the reason that's okay is because if you need a counter and someone gives you a reset counter, you can only, you never need to call the reset method. And so now what you can do is you can say, well, okay, how can we actually, we, we sort of hard coded an object here. So how can we, uh, how can we build multiple, how can we build multiple, uh, multiple such things? And so what we can do is we can say, well, we can use a, func uh, a function. And so now what we can do is we can define C1 is a new counter. And C2 is also a new counter. And so now if we do C1.increment, then C1.get is going to be one as we expect. But when we do C2.get, it's still zero because we allocated a, a fresh reference for C1 and for C2. And so this operation is an object generator. It's a lot like a constructor in an OO language. And so now um, what we can do to, to head towards something more like full-fledged classes is to say, well, what we did was we said we had a counter, had two fields, uh, get an increment and the state was hidden. So if you look at the code, we create some state, but it, the the value R never leaves the scope. Uh, the, never leaves the scope directly. It's only referred to indirectly by the methods. And so if we want to get something a bit closer to classes, what we can do is in the first step, make the internal state into a record. Um, and so we'll say, all right, what I want is I'm going to have the representation of a, uh, of a, uh, of our counter. It's, it's internal state is going to be this record type P int ref. And then what our counter class constructor will do is it'll say, okay, 
if you give me a counter representation, I'll give you a real counter. And the way that works is it's going to say, give me that reference, and then I'll return the pair ink, uh, get and ink for you. And now what you can do is you can say, well, I'm going to have a constructor which creates a fresh counter represent uh, representation and then passes it to the counter class constructor. And so now this is starting to look a bit like Java, where when you invoke a method constructor, you never actually explicitly build the counter representation. You just modify it in your constructor. And if you have the method, uh, if you have this uh, uh, method dictionary and the uh, explicit counter class, uh, sorry, the explicit uh, um, fields, what you can do is we can start to uh, head towards modeling inheritance. So if we have, if we want to build a reset counter class, it says, okay, if you give me the representation of a counter, which is just going to be the single integer, what you can do is you can, uh, you can use the, uh, you can use the, you can build, you can use the counter class method to build a counter and forward that to the get and your get and ink methods forward to that super object. And then your own reset operation, what it's going to do is it's just going to actually use its access to the private state in order to do the update. And so now our counter representation hasn't changed between counter and reset counter, but the method dictionaries have changed. And the reset counter actually inherits its behavior from the counter class. Uh, from the counter class constructor. And so if we translated this to, oh, something like Java, then what we, we can do is we can say, okay, well, in the counter class, we have this protected field, which is not visible to anything except some classes. And now we're going to have a constructor which initializes the, uh, the that integer to zero, and then the get and increment methods work the way that you expect. We either increment the counter or you return its contents. And then when you, when you write reset counter, extends counter, what you can do is you can refer to the protected field in the, in the subclass. And so you're able, we're able to sort of mimic what the Java compiler does in, in L3 with some record subtyping. However, this emulation is not totally perfect because in a, uh, with the record subtyping that we've seen, it has a structural flavor. So you decide whether one type is a subtype of another by looking at the fields and methods of a, uh, the fields of a record and seeing if uh, uh, one has fewer, more specific fields than another. And so what you get is like a fairly rich lattice where you say, okay, the the empty record is a supertype of p int, and p int is a supertype of both p p int q bool and p int r int. Whereas with objects, um, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, subsumption is a bit more restricted. So, so if we uh, if we go back here to our point and we create another point, let's call it point, point uh, two, and we give it exactly the same fields as, uh, as point does, point and point two will be incompatible as types because they're not, there's no subtype relationship between them. They're both subtype, subclasses of objects. And so even though their structure is the same, uh, Java will refuse to accept that point and point two are equivalent classes. And so modeling this kind of name-based subtyping, what's called nominal subtyping, is uh, something that's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. Okay, and so uh, next time I will start talking about concurrency. Thank you.